Hello everyone, as many of you are probably aware, LaserPig made a response video to my LaserPig is wrong about the 14 Armata video. So I am now making a response video to his response video that is a response to my video response to his original T14 Armata video. But his video is not just a response to my video, but a response to the video made by Cone of Arc as well. I hope that is easy to understand. I want to note that this video is not about me defending the T14 Armata, nor was my original video. It was about correcting the mistakes. That being said, his response video is much worse than I expected. Before you call me a Vatnik for saying that, I would like you to watch and hear what I have to say. His video ignores a lot of the points I made in my original response, and hyperfocuses on several of the points that I made and the points being made by Cone. The problem is that the V2 engine and the Armatas engine are just a couple of points I bring up in my original video. He also talks about modern ammunition of T90, maximum speed of T90 and T14 breakdown, but again, he fails to address a lot of the points from my video. He says he has made mistakes in his original video and that he has apologized for them and has deleted them from the video. At the time of me making this video, the only point he has removed and apologized for is the engine of Honda Jazz having comparable torque to the engine of T90M. That is it. But there are some extremely obvious mistakes in his video that he has not apologized for, nor has he removed them from the video. And don't worry, we will get to them later. Before we do, I have to comment on something he keeps mentioning over and over again in his response video. How I am parroting Russian propaganda, how I am well known in the community for using Soviet sources and thus I am hypercritical of Western tanks and I gloss over the problems of Russian and Soviet tanks. Red is a person who is very well known in the community for relying heavily on Soviet sources, which have led him to make some very questionable claims. He is typically hypercritical of every aspect of Western armour, but tends to gloss over the flaws of anything Russian or Soviet in design. I do believe this is terribly disingenuous, and rather than him trying to disprove my points, he keeps bringing that point up, which in turn paints a picture of me as someone who should not be trusted. I don't know if that was his intention, but the statements he makes about me do come across in that way. The truth is that, well, I criticize a lot of Russian stuff. I made a plethora of videos just focusing on the problems of Russian tanks. Constantly bringing up their poor reverse speed every time I mention them is just one of the things that comes to my mind. One of my latest videos, Performance of T90M, came out as a result of me being bombarded with people sending me Russian propaganda outlets claiming Russia has made their 200 T90 tank back in December and how awesome and fast their production rate is. I, in return, spent so much time finding every single report of T90M tank delivery in order to disprove that claim, which I knew was bollocks. Another thing that comes to my mind is me making videos on silly Russian claims about how T14 is going to Ukraine, debunking the claims of Russian propagandists like Solovyev. Just because they debunk Ukrainian propaganda as well, like how Russians are absolutely unable to produce tanks, does not mean I am someone who parrots Russian propaganda. People generally see my thumbnails, which are most of the time questions, and assume that those questions are my beliefs, without realizing that I claim quite the opposite in a lot of them. For example, Russians did not capture a Leopard 26. This tank is not a new super tank, it's just a T-72 with a bunch of cages on it, and so on. One of the things he brought up about me being critical of Western tanks is a comment I made about Challenger 2's lower front plate being an area that can be penetrated by World War II guns. His critique of the Challenger 2 strikes a particular chord with me, especially when he claimed the frontal lower plate could be penetrated by World War II era guns. For a long time, Challenger 2 had problems with the protection of the lower front plate. The lower front plate is only 60mm thick which means that it can be penetrated even by World War II guns. And ignore the fact that this area was always intended to house explosive reactive armour. Even in its first deployments in Kosovo, you can see these massive ERA blocks on the front. This is a point I made in a video about Challenger 2 problems from January 2020, more than a three and a half years ago. Hell, that's older than the oldest video on LaserPix channel. The point was supposed to be funny segue to me talking about how they made the ERA and then the Dorchester armor to cover the lower front plate. I even say that the Challenger wouldn't be deployed without the Dorchester plate now because it is a part of the theater entry standard package. I also want to know that this is how Challenger 2 tanks are meant to be deployed. 
So, if there is a need for them to go to war, this will be a standard upgrade before the tanks are sent to any kind of operation. But he does not put this in the video. Yes, I did make a mistake, because my statement assumed that the ERA wasn't there from the start, which it was. That being said, the ERA is made to counter shaped charge munitions, so me saying it can be penetrated by World War II guns is technically not wrong. But I do make mistakes, I make mistakes all the time. In my response video for example I said how Challenger 3 uses Attica thermals, while it actually uses Orion from Thales. I already knew that, I said that in my Challenger 3 video a while ago, but I simply made a mistake. But as I was saying, I do make mistakes. If you watch some of my older videos, you will see that they are filled with mistakes. That is because I didn't know as much back then as I know now, hence why I have made a lot of mistakes. But saying that I am someone who parrots Russian propaganda because of that is extremely disingenuous. I do like talking about Soviet, Ukrainian and Russian tanks a lot, I will not deny that. I do find them to be very interesting, most of the videos on my channel are about those tanks, but I do constantly point out their problems, saying I don't simply shows you are not familiar with my content. He also said how me and Cohn do research only online, which is kind of funny. I have recently only been making content about current events or the most modern tanks, not really about history, so there is nowhere I can find information other than online. I actually have a lot of books about tanks, some of which are pretty rare. I have a bunch of manuals and documents, which I also use for information in my videos. I have even gone on military exhibitions to talk with tankers and engineers about vehicles being presented, and have made videos using the information they have provided me with. I also consult real tankers on specific appropriate topics like I did with my original response video, including making interviews with those tankers. And I know Cone has been using a lot of sources that are not online sources. For example, he used documents from the Canadian archives for his Firefly video. So saying we only do our research online, again, just shows that he's not familiar with our content at all. Then he says how my title and thumbnail are clickbait intended for his fans, and how he doesn't appreciate someone messing with his fans. The point of the video was to point out mistakes that have been made in his T-14 Armata video, and there are quite a bit of mistakes. I do say you are wrong about a lot of stuff, so saying you are wrong in the title is utterly clickbait nor is it any drama bait as he is insinuating. The point of the video was to correct the mistakes being made, to show the people that have watched Laserpig's video that he makes mistakes in it, to point them out to them. The thumbnail is certainly attention grabbing, but it's most definitely not clickbait. Me clickbaiting would be something along the lines, Laserpig gets absolutely destroyed with facts and logic, but I did not do that, I simply made a video. Correcting or attempting to correct, depending on how you want to look at it, the mistakes being made in the original video, and show the people who have watched it that there are mistakes being made. Hence the title and the entire video being a thing. The thing is that, if he only made a mistake about the engine, I wouldn't have made that entire video. I have made many videos in the past, indirectly trying to disprove some of the claims other content creators have made, without mentioning them at all. I'm obviously not going to say which videos those are exactly, and who they are about, it would defeat the entire purpose, but what I'm trying to say is that I would have done the same here. I would have probably made a video titled, is T-14's engine a copy of German World War II engine or something similar, and I wouldn't have mentioned Laser Pig anywhere. The problem is, as I already said, he makes many more mistakes in his original video, and I felt that those mistakes had to be corrected for the general public that has seen the video and so I did the video the way I did. All of that being said, I honestly did not expect this kind of a response from Laserpig. I have talked a bit with him after my video, got an impression he was a nice guy, he told me he was going to make a response video sometime in the future, and to me it seemed we parted on a good note, and him making a community post, seeing how he talked with me and how I'm a nice guy, further reinforced that. Then watching the video after all of that just leaves a sour taste in my mouth. I expected him to make some jokes at my expense, since that is what his channel is about, entertainment. But to make such silly claims about me that I have to make a 10 minute segment, just trying to debunk them is something I did not expect. Yes, I know he says I shouldn't have been this harsh on Red Effect in the video, but saying that does not negate all the things he has said. He also talks about me parroting Russian propaganda while literally having one of his shows 
partnered with Ukrainian government-run media. I'm sorry that you had to sit through this entire thing, now is the time of the video where we get into the juicy parts, and by that I mean the actual points being addressed from my and Cone's videos. Also, I will mainly be addressing the points of the video about me, Cone will be making his own video covering the parts regarding him, like the history of the SLA-16 engine, if you want to see that. In this part, he wants to debunk my claim that the modification of the Kharkiv Model V2 engine, the same engine being used in the World War II era BT-7, is not the engine being used in the T-90. You'll note, he never says it wasn't. He completely missed the point of that segment. The point I was trying to get across is that the V2 was not specifically a BT-7 engine. I was trying to point out that BT-7M was being used for testing the engine before it entered service with T-34, KV and BT-7M pretty much at the same time. It was a response to him saying it's a BT-7 engine and it's just more famous for being used on T-34 and KV, while it was an engine developed for tank use in general. I didn't mean to imply that BT-7M was just an experimental tank, as it did enter service. All I said is that it was used for testing the engine first before that happened. Saying it's a BT-7 engine would imply that it was made for BT-7, which is not true. Whether it was your intention or not, a lot of people did draw that conclusion. A lot of comments about the T-90 using BT-7 engine started appearing, which takes us to the next part. But I wasn't wrong, the T-90 does use the same engine that was once used in the BT-7, or a modification of it at any rate. The most they have done to the Kharkov Model V2 was supercharge the hell out of it. It's a modification of the same engine. It looks prettier, yes. It's maybe got some plastic covers where metal used to be, but I'd expect that. Saying that the V92S2F is the same engine as the original V2 is wrong. Yes, it is a modification. And in my segment when I'm describing that, I do say, I do know he said it is not actually the same engine. I know he said it is not actually the same engine, but people generally just hear that piece of information and believe that the T90M uses an engine from the 30s, which is not the case at all. I know he meant it as a modification, but as I said, a lot of people came to the conclusion that it's exactly the same, hence why I made that part explaining that it is not exactly the same for people that do believe it is, not as a direct response to Lazybeck's claim. I perhaps should have made that more clear. Now, saying that they just supercharged the engine is also wrong. V2 went through many changes. The V54, for example, had the entire lower crankcase redesigned and saw changes to the piston design when compared to the earlier engines, like V44 or V11 IS3, both of which are also further modification of the V2. During its service, it also saw a number of changes, like simplification to the cooling or increasing the reliability with the changes in the gaskets. V54G and V54B engines had the new, more powerful generators, since the engines now had to power the stabilizers. V55 saw an increase in power with the optimization of the compression ratio and many other changes like numerous changes in filter designs. The V55U engine saw an increase to 620 horsepower thanks to the changes done to the fuel injection system. They came to 620 horsepower from 500 horsepower without using any kind of supercharger, which is definitely not an easy thing to do. The first engine in the active service to use the supercharger was the V46. Funny thing is that the latest engine, the V92S2F, doesn't even have a supercharger, but a compact turbocharger, which required a bunch of little changes to be done to the engine when it was implemented. There were many other changes done to many other V2 engines over the years, if anyone wants, I can do a video about the V2 engine in the future where I can go more in detail about its development. Engine development is an extremely complex topic, so implying later versions or modifications are the same or copies is incorrect, but I want to keep this short for now since the video is already going to be long. Ah, but what about the Leo 2 engine? That's from the 70s! He goes on. Oh great, another wonderful argumentative fallacy. What about -ism? Brilliant. Yes, the engine is from the 70s because that's when they built the Leopard 2. The point made in the original reply video was to bring context behind modern tank engines and how the V92 is not a special exception when most of the modern tanks currently being used feature engines with lineages nearly as old or even older than the lineage of the V92. Laserpig accuses me of whataboutism, which I do not believe I have done. Whataboutism is typically used to completely redirect argument and move away from the original point. 
What I'm seeing with all of this is that context in this specific case is important when criticizing the V92 in this way, because this is far more common than one would think. Tank engines should be judged on merit, not age without any context, especially not the family of engines that has been modified and improved in significant ways over the past 80 or so years. Laserpig also brings up that the Leopard 2's engine is as old as the tank itself and claims both are from the 70s, which is not true. The Leopard 2's engine was developed for the Kampfpanzer 70 in the 1960s. It is technically an old engine and, unlike V2, it has seen little to no changes since its introduction. Well, it didn't have to since it's a good engine, but that is beside the point. What he completely glossed over was me bringing up the official information of CV-12, the engine being used in Challenger 2 and the future Challenger 3, states that it is built upon the legacy of the Condor engine, an engine over 100 years old. Of course, it has been changed since then, but the point being made was that, when compared to the other engines, V2 isn't really a special case. Most of the diesel engines used in modern tanks are old, and just because they are old does not mean they are bad. That was the entire point of that segment. Again, I should point out that these are not simply copies, or the same with a bunch of changes to the original engines. Although they may originate from an older engine, most of the parts are not interchangeable given the immense differences between them. The point of that particular argument wasn't heard or the engine is from World War II, I may have focused on that for comedic effect, but the point was that the engine has reached the limit of what it is capable of technologically through upgrades and modifications quite some time ago, and that the T90 is underperforming because of it. I would agree that the engine has reached its limit, although I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if Russians could pull something more out of it, so I'm not going to state anything for certain. But to say that T90 is underperforming because of it is ridiculous. I will explain it in the next segment when he makes the comparison with the Western diesels. And that Western designs far exceeded in capability in spite of what should have been an obvious advantage that the T90 should have in terms of maneuverability and speed. Instead, it's operating on par with tanks multiple tons heavier than it. Which means in order to achieve the same speed it has to be lighter, which means it cannot afford to have the same level of equipment and protection as Western designs. Red ignores this and instead strawmans me, making up an entirely new argument and debating on me from there, using loaded language to imply that I've made a mistake, where in fact I haven't. To anyone who has watched my first video, this will seem ridiculous. I've never ignored Western designs. As a matter of fact, I used actual data to compare it to the Western designs. And the conclusion was that it's pretty much comparable to the engine of Challenger 2, but less powerful than the German Leopard 2 engine. But at the same time, is much lighter and smaller. I will now roll the footage from the original video just so you can understand that better. The V2, while it still works, is extremely bulky, extremely heavy, and incredibly archaic in its design. It is not really. Of course, if you look at some of the most advanced diesel engine designs for tanks, you could make such an argument. But if you look at the diesel engines currently being used in NATO tanks, it is far from it. V92 S2F, the most modern variant, is very comparable in size to the Challenger's CV-12 engine and has very similar performance, where CV-12 has a bit more horsepower and V92 has a bit more torque, but it is much lighter. CV-12's dry weight is stated to be 1980 kg, while V92 S2F weighs 1050 kg, almost two times lighter, so it is far from being heavy and it is pretty much as bulky as CV-12. Now let's look at MTU873, the engine of Leopard 2 and KF51. This engine is much bigger than both CV12 and V92, and also weighs more, its dry weight being around 2200 kg. Granted, this engine does produce more horsepower and torque, but if we are going to talk about the bulky and heavy, then this is it. And of course, again, none of this is to say that any of these engines are bad. What Laserpig doesn't seem to understand is that smaller engines generally produce less power than larger engines. T90 tanks are smaller than Leopard 2 tanks and have much smaller engine bays, which means they can't pack as big of a power pack as NATO tanks can. This means that both engine and transmission must be smaller. For engines, this means they can't produce as much power, and for transmissions, it means they can't be as effective as the Western ones. Hence why they have problems with the maximum speed, especially in reverse. For its size, the V92 S2F is not at all a bad engine, as already stated, just compared to the CV12 of the similar size. They are practically comparable in performance, but the power pack of Leopard 2 is much larger, therefore it is capable of producing more power. The 
downside is that it is almost two times heavier, but for the Leopard 2, that extra weight is more than worth for the power the engine provides to the tank. This brings us to the next point. To give you another example and to continue on from the point I made earlier, that part where I'm comparing the speed of the Challenger 2 to the T90 and he's like, er, er, that's not how you measure speed. Tanks never go their full speed on the battlefield, it's all about acceleration. Not the point. The point was the Challenger 2 is 20 tons heavier than the T90 and can go the same speed. A much lighter tank should be able to run rings around the Challenger 2, not match it. The speed for tanks is generally capped around 60 to 70 km per hour because concerns of wear and tear of components such as tracks and also because tanks in general hardly travel at such speeds anyways, let alone beyond it. Laserpig seems to have a misunderstanding as to how top speeds of tanks work. The transmission, specifically the gear ratios, is what truly determines top speed. Engine power, as well as the weight of the tank itself, ignoring the myriad of other less significant factors, determines how quickly it can reach the top speed. To show a related example, in the 2019 tank Biathlon, a T-72B3 was able to hit a record speed of 84 km per hour. This B3 was likely equipped with a modified transmission that allowed it to go at higher top speed and is unlikely to be the standard on tanks in active service. Another example is the Leopard 2A7. The tank of Red Leopard 2A7 V book I have talks about how it was important to sacrifice top speed for the acceleration and how top speed is just, and I quote, a nominal figure without any major practical use anyway. Considering all of this, a tank such as the T90M will be quicker able to reach its forward top speed on-road and off-road faster than the Challenger 2. That is, if they really wanted the T90M or the Challenger 2 to reach their maximum speed. However, Russian tank transmissions have downsides such as the extremely poor reverse speeds, which I always bring up as criticism of Russian tanks. All in all, when it comes to Russian tank automotives, the criticism should lie less on the engine and more on the transmission, where there are actual issues to find. Quickly another example, the, the T90 not being able to fire modern ammunition. I mean, unless you consider the 3MB60 modern ammunition, because it's not modern ammunition, it's it's ammunition made in the modern day, yes, and I assume it's better than the older ammunition, but it's, it's nowhere near on par with Western ammunition, which is why Russia needed the T14. I said that the modern Russian ammunition is inferior to the most modern Western ammunition. I agree with that, but to say it is not modern just because it is inferior is not really correct. Russians have a problem with not being able to make a longer APFSDS projectiles. The latest one has pretty much reached the limit. The reason is that the outloader does not allow for longer shells to be loaded into the carousel, but it does incorporate a modern design. It is very comparable in its design to the German DM63, that being the overall structure and the length to diameter ratio. Germany is developing a new projectile, the M73, but until we actually see it being fielded, the M63 will remain the most modern APF SDS for many NATO countries. There is also the British L27A1, which is shorter than either 3BM60 and the DM63. Based on its training ground, we can expect it to be 660mm long at best. The only projectile that is really superior to the 3BM60 is the American MA29A4. He also completely ignores me stating that the T90M is made to fire programmable high explosive ammunition like the most modern NATO tanks. It's just that there is no evidence this round is actually being fielded, but we did see a demonstration of T90M with the said projectile. So we know for a fact that T90M can fire modern projectiles. And he does this again with the Arjun, confusing its original 70s program with the more recent announcements on its upgrades and redevelopment, ignoring all the critique of the T90 that has come out of India in recent years. In my original video, I said the T90 actually has problems in the hot and desert areas between Pakistan and India, hence why Arjun is reserved for those areas and T90 for the mountainous areas on the border with China. That was the response to Laserpeak saying that T90 has problems in high altitude terrains and India lacked urgent tank support during its border skirmishes with China, which is absolutely not true. There are many reports of India deploying the tanks there, and I even brought up the example of them doing so in 2020. There were complaints and criticisms of T90 coming from India, but they either revolved around T90's performance in hot weather or it having issues because of the domestically produced parts. An example of this includes the issues with the radiators that they had because the production was given to an inexperienced company, and so on. But to say that it has problems in the mountains is not really true. There are reports from India about commanders praising the tank and how it would crush the Chinese light tanks and so on. 
Arjun is now reserved for use in the Rajasthan region because of the climate and the desert terrain, where Arjun excels over the D90. It was even nicknamed the Desert Ferrari by some Indian experts. He does it again with the Abrams engine where he repeats the fuel consumption myth. The gas turbine engine of Abrams definitely does consume a lot more fuel than the diesel engines of NATO tanks. Main reason being the fuel consumption on idle. Abrams has had a big period without an APU since SEP only SEP V3 are now getting APU again. I have talked with Abrams tankers, the tank definitely is a fuel guzzler. APU does make a difference, I'm not even going to spend time arguing this point. The claim that the T14 which broke down on the practice parade was just a driver engaging the emergency brake is not really true. What Red has forgotten of course is when we only had this footage, Russia claimed that this was all part of the performance, that the T-14 had stopped deliberately as part of a rehearsal in case it happened on the real day and they had to actually tow away a broken down tank. They even announced this to the crowd via loudspeaker and it was reported in all the Russian newspapers the following day, until this video emerged, in which this towing vehicle is trying to move the Armata and clearly having trouble, and then the story about the emergency brake starts getting reported. This is the most disingenuous part of his video. He talks about me falling for Russia propaganda and believing that it was an accidental engagement of the handbrake and not a breakdown, while I literally showed the part when the crew went back into the tank and drove it off. I showed this in my video and talked about it, but he completely cut it out of his video to paint me as someone who falls for Russian propaganda. Yes, the announcer did say that this was a planned rehearsal of a breakdown, what else was he supposed to say? They did not expect this to happen, at the time of the announcement he did not know what was the actual issue. Was he supposed to say, oh hey everyone our tank crew and officers have no idea what is going on with our latest tank that we want everyone to believe is amazing, he's obviously not going to say that. And as Chieftain said, even if it did actually break down, that doesn't have to mean much. Was it funny? Absolutely. This was the first presentation of the new super tank and seeing it drive to a halt live was arguably funny, but to argue that this incident is supposed to indicate anything about the tank's performance is ridiculous. From all the tankers I have personally spoken to, tanks break all the time, especially in the hands of the inexperienced crew. Now, as I already said, T-14 most likely did not break down. Even if it did, who cares? We do see it driving off on its own, so if it did break down, it wasn't anything severe. The problem with this part was how LazyPay completely cut out the part of me showing and talking about the tank driving off later. I honestly don't know what to say about that. No one in Russia is going to admit the T-14 is a failure and risk arrest. No one is going to say the tank has engine problems or that the engine is derived from an old Nazi design. This is funny to me because the actual origin of the SLA-16 being connected to the A85, the engine of T-14 Armata, are some Russian sources. It was the Russian bloggers who first wrote about that. Now, saying that no one is going to say anything negative about T-14 Armata in Russia is absolutely false. Both me and Laserpig linked to sources from Russians and Russian engineers bringing up problems related to the T-14, and one of my sources even blames corruption of the Ural Wagon Zavod for the events that transpired around the cancellation of Object 195 and the subsequent development of T-14 in its stead. But yeah, I guess they can't say anything bad. And many of the said bloggers and engineers have, as I already mentioned, brought up connections between the SLA-16 and the A-85. But no one has ever stated it is a copy, because it isn't. They say things like it's based on SLA-16 or SLA-16 is the heart of this engine, with nothing to back that up, mind you. They just mention it, which kinda contradicts the claim that they are not allowed to say anything. And I already said this, but they have to bring it up again. Literally the origin of this claim is a Russian source. Laserpig used Russian sources to back this up in his original video. Before we go into what became the biggest debacle from these videos, the T-14 Armata engine, I want to address several points. Laserpig does not list any sources in his video. He says that the reason for that is that he wants me and Cohn to go through as much effort as he and the guys who helped him did. To me, this is definitely not a valid reason to not list your sources. The video will not be seen by just me and Cohn. hundreds of thousands of people will see it. Maybe some people with actual knowledge who can contribute something. Not listing your sources leaves a lot of room for speculation and actual questioning of their validity. I've seen a lot of people say something along the lines, oh he did not list them because he doesn't have any or something similar. Next thing I want to address is him saying how I heavily rely on Russian sources. This is kind of hypocritical because the big majority of the sources he provides 
for his original video are Russian sources. Only one of his sources are actually English, and it's largely just repeating the things already said in the Russian article he links, the one that talks about the engine being a copy of SLA-16. And just because those sources are Russian, that does not invalidate them. I searched interviews with people who were actually involved in development of Object 195, one of which, Alexei Hlopotov, blames corruption for its cancellation, as I mentioned already. Alexei also writes his own articles, articles that both me and Laserpick searched on our videos. He's in general highly critical of the Russian government, and until a couple of months ago had no war on every single one of his articles on his page, but had to remove them because of the stupid Russian law. Another is BTBT, which is written by a Ukrainian called Andrei Tarasenko. He is far from being pro-Russian, some would say he's overly pro-Ukrainian, and he's more than critical of Russian vehicles. I often use both Andrei and Alexei as sources in my videos, including the T-14 one. They aren't always 100% correct, but implying that they would be someone who parrots Russian propaganda is ridiculous to say the least. Now, I want to bring up the points that were not addressed by Laserpig. He says how for most of my video I simply go nah uh and make him appear wrong when he isn't, but he fails to bring up a lot of things, things that were obvious mistakes. For example, he confused Object 640 and Object 195, since they were both dubbed T95. He said that modern NATO tanks have retractable periscopes, which is not the case. I had several NATO tankers from different nations confirm this to me. Even though I knew it was not the case, I still asked for confirmation. He says that the BMP is made on a tank chassis and uses the V2 engine, which is absolutely not true. It's a different design with a completely different engine. He says tanks had automatic target tracking in the 1960s. That's not all, there's more, but I will just list it on the screen in order not to make this video longer than necessary. Thing is, I wouldn't have had problems if he said that he was wrong on many things and will address only those that he considers as a mistake on my part, but no, he said that he has apologized for mistakes and he has deleted them from the video. The only thing he has apologized for and deleted is the part about the engine of Honda Jazz having comparable torque to the engine of T90M. He then goes on to say how throughout the entire video I completely ignore the points he makes and how I go off on a straw man, how I only made it seem that he was wrong when he actually wasn't, and so on. He never acknowledges any of the mistakes he mentioned earlier and just goes off on those he believes he is right about. He also says how the tank museum said the same thing and how neither me or Cohen wanted to go against them. Well, they made the video well after my video, why should I be repeating myself? They still made the mistake, and I'm saying it now. They are wrong, it is not a copy, nor was it made for pumping stations. But if they did this before, I probably would have made the video just talking about the engine, like I said before. And they do make mistakes sometimes, it's just not worth making an entire video about them. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's get into the engine. First, I will address what I believe are mistakes that he makes about the history and the development of the Russian X engines. I won't be focusing a lot on the history of the SLA-16 engine, Cone of Arc will be more focused on that, so I would suggest you go and watch his video about that. Prior to 2014, the Russian military were adamant that X engines were pointless and that they would never develop one. They considered it a technological dead end, and to a point, they are right. X engines are not popular and are very rarely used in the modern age due to the design simply being overcomplicated and prone to excessive wear. In fact, when one was presented to the Russians back in 2013, they ignored it. Russians were never really adamant that X engines were pointless. I could find some bloggers and some specific people complaining about them, but it wasn't the general view that everyone held. You will always have people argue against or in favor of certain things. What is often brought up for the X-layout engines by those who have been arguing in their favor is the fact that they take up as much volume as the other engines while providing more power. One thing that contradicts that they ignored the engines is the Object 195 and T-14 Armata development. Object 195 was a tank that had the A85 engine during the 2000s. T-14 Armata is a direct continuation of this tank and was first unveiled in 2015. There is no way that they did a complete 180 in just a year. T-14 was in development since at least 2010. But one thing is certain, not everyone is really happy with the X-Layout A85 engine currently being used on T14. Main criticism is that it is not powerful enough and that it is a somewhat old design. 
the Chelyabinsk factory was actually tasked with developing a new engine for T-14, an engine that they failed to deliver on time and lost the funding for its development. And at some point in the 60s, a 16-valve ex-diesel engine matching the configuration of the SLE-16 shows up as a potential for the engine of the T-64. It's developed by a bunch of students working for Transdiesel, and to try and make it fit, they knocked it from 16 cylinders down to 12. The army rejected it, and development of the engine further was forbidden. The first X-Series engine that appeared was in 1977, the 16-cylinder 2V16. It was very different from the SLA-16, but we will get to that later. The original configuration for the engine was too weak, but the updated engine was accepted for trials on an Object 219RD during the early 80s, which is actually a T-80B tank, not a T-64. The engine was practically approved in 1985 and was being recommended for serial production in 1988. The source for this is the one laser pick put on the screen. This is a Russian source that was translated into English. I will leave a link to it in the description, and I have already used this source in my last video. Next, about the development being forbidden, he has this image on the screen. I recognized that the image in the article had a German text on it, and I immediately recognized that the source is Stefan Koch's website. I contacted him directly about the said claim in his article, and he told me that it should be read in the context of the T-72, told me he took the info from a book, and then literally sent me the book he used. The book writes that in the late 70s, the diesel engines were largely disregarded in favor of the gas turbines, writes how the 12-cylinder engine already exceeded turbines in performance, but was not accepted. Then it states that the Minister of Defense, Sergei Zverev, forbade its development and said how he doesn't even want to hear the engine mentioned in his presence. The thing is, Zverev died in 1978, and we have official Ministry of Defense reports from 1979 about both 2V16 and 2V12 X layout engines. The book also says that the Kharkiv 60D diesel was also banned, yet we saw this engine accepted into service in 1987 on T80UD. A lot of Soviet officials had biases and did not allow certain things to be developed because of that. Zverev was no exception. But one could argue that his death changed things pretty rapidly, since we have both 2V engines and 60D being tested in the early 80s. I also have a book from a Ukrainian engineer, Ryazantsev, who was present in 1989 during the meeting where they were deciding what engine should be used for the future Soviet tank. The decision was being made between the Ukrainian 60D and the 2V12 x layout engine. Of course, the USSR collapsed, so the discussion was in vain. But this also goes against the claim that the development was forbidden. It shows up again in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union, this time as an engine for a tank called Object 477. From what I could find, Object 477 uses the Ukrainian 60D3 engine that produced 1500 horsepower, and it makes sense since that is a Ukrainian engine for a Ukrainian tank. Why would a Ukrainian project use a Russian engine? And if you read the source he lists on the screen, it seems to imply that the 152mm gun is known for being used in Object 477, and the actual article is about another tank, could either be Object 195 or the Russian sources that talked about T-14 getting the 152mm gun a bit after the tank was unveiled to the public. But I don't know for sure, because Laserspeak did not list his sources, but this is definitely a translated online source, there is no doubt about that. From what we know, the 16-cylinder variant was trialed on the Object 219RD in the early to mid-80s. We saw it then on the Object 186 in the mid-80s. It was then proposed for serial production in the late 80s. Then we see the 12-cylinder engine appear on one of the Object 187 prototypes in 1990, where the tank passed 12,000 km in total with the engine. Then it appears again on the Object 195, where it is successfully tested, and then we see it finally on the T-14. It was proposed and apparently trialled in the T-95, but again, information, or should I say reliable information on the T-95, is scarce. Hence why so many people, including myself, just don't believe it ever existed outside of a money pit in a mock-up. T-95, or rather, Object 195, was most definitely real. There is a lot of reliable information, and we do have interviews with people that worked on the tank and the engine passed trials on the Object 185, hence why it got accepted for the T-14 Armata. One of the books I have also talks about the successful firing trials, which definitely makes the tank real. 
There is literally nothing that would imply this tank did not exist. There are pictures of it, and there is a lot of information, unless you want to disregard all information about the cancelled project as Russian propaganda, information that also contains criticism of the Russian government and the manufacturer. It shows up again in the 2000s, this time for sale as a pumping station engine. This may seem weird, and I know Red was like, er, er, no, it was exclusively developed for use in tanks. Shut up. The X engine was called the A85-3, and it showed up as a pumping station engine. Trans Diesel were facing bankruptcy, and they were literally just throwing everything they had out there to whomever would want to buy an engine. The A85-3 was very similar to the 12-cylinder diesel engine we saw back on the T-64 program. Your original claim was that the engine was developed for oil compressing and pumping stations. Now you're saying they were facing bankruptcy and were thus selling it. Okay, I never claimed otherwise. That could have very much been the case. But this engine was developed in the 70s for tanks not oil stations. This myth originates from the pamphlet of the manufacturer, which only lists that under possible applications of the engine, together with other special purpose vehicles. This is also repeated in the advertisement they made that I featured in the sources of my last video. It's an engine, it can be used for those things, that does not mean it was developed for them. But as many sources tell us, including the boot that I got from Koch, it was made for tanks. There is no reliable source that claimed it wasn't, except for some silly articles. As Laserpig brings out in his video, these articles really shouldn't be trusted by themselves. And, as I already said, it was not made for the T-64. It was never installed in a T-64, but a T-80B. The thing is, at this time, the Russians had a new tank program. It didn't have a name at this point, it was simply called the Modernized T-90S. But most likely, that was the tank we now know as the Armata. I'm wondering, how do you conclude that a modernized T-90S is a T-14 Armata? If we read the search on the screen, it tells us about the new turret, talks about Sosna U and panoramic sight. This sounds kinda like modernized T-90S, you know, the T-90MS, where M literally stands for modernized, T-90 modernized S, the tank was literally advertised as modernized T-90S at the time. T14 was very secretive, everything related to it was top secret in 2013. Anything that would even remotely resemble the T14 would get a lot of attention, and allowing journalists to see it would make absolutely no sense. And based on the name, yeah, this tank had literally nothing to do with T14, it most certainly was a T90 MS, which according to numerous sources was first shown in 2013. The engine is a totally new design, and the fact that it uses a lot of the same unconventional design elements as the SLA-16, an engine they captured five intact examples of, as well as all the plants and engineers who built them, is purely coincidental. After a lot of back and forth, I can honestly say that no one can really answer for definite yes or no. The information we have on this engine is scarce at best, and is wrapped in multiple layers of speculation and conjecture. Based on the research I have done, and speaking to some actual mechanical engineers about the two engines, I've come to the conclusion that the engines are not the same. They share very little between each other, and therefore, A85-3 is not a copy of SLA-16, nor is it a modification of it. Let me tell you why. For that, I need to do a quick explanation of some engine parts, so you could better understand what I'm talking about. Every engine has banks. Those are basically the sides where each row of cylinder lies. Each of these has four banks because they are axle out engines. There is a crankshaft, which converts the reciprocation of the pistons into a rotational motion, a very important part of the engine. Each crankshaft has pins on it, where the connecting rods of pistons are connected to the crankshaft. Connecting rods are basically the rods that connect pistons to the crankshaft. Okay, let's start with what could possibly be considered the biggest difference between the two engines, the crankshaft. It's not only that they are different in a way that it's uh, redesigned, it's a completely different model of a crankshaft. Changing a crankshaft would require quite a big change in the engine's design. The SLA-16 engine had a journal bearing crankshaft with four pins. It has four connecting rods per pin. This is achieved by the presence of one master connecting rod and three link rods connected to it. This information comes from the source laser pig had on the screen, the American report of the engine. We also have a picture of the crankshaft which further confirms this. On the other hand, V2 series of engines have a tunnel crankshaft, with 8 pins for the 16-cylinder variant and 6 pins for the 12-cylinder variant. Tunnel crankshaft is a different design and got the name because it requires a tunnel in the crankcase of the engine because of its design. This one has basically two connecting rods per pin, and they are assembled in a V-shape. One would be connected to the piston in the top bank and the other to the piston in the lower bank on each side. 
This is not done in the same way as on the V2 engines, which use a master-slave design of connecting rods, but rather in a fork and blade design. Now, how do we know all of this? Well, we have a Vastnik Science and Technology Journal of the Ministry of Defense of USSR from 1979. Here, Butov, the creator of these engines, describes a lot of their functionality. We have diagrams of their operation, as well as the firing order of the cylinders, both of which confirm that there are 8 pins on the crankshaft. Here, he also describes the connecting rods. We also have his patent for the crankcase, confirming that it is indeed a tunnel crankshaft. This is all further confirmed by the mother public analysis of the 2V06 engine, the 6N15-16, which is literally the A85 engine cut in half. That is, with two banks on one side removed, making it a 6-cylinder instead of a 12-cylinder engine, but because of that, it is no longer an X layout engine, but a V layout, which doesn't really matter in this case. We have actual pictures of the crankshaft, we also have a 3D diagrams of the engine, which also show us the tunnel crankshaft design. Next. Very different thing is the cooling. SLA-16 is air-cooled, while the 2V series of engines use liquid cooling. For air cooling, the engine needs to have a design that would allow proper airflow to cool the entire engine, as well as design ideas like fins to help with cooling. Liquid cooling requires chambers around the cylinders for the liquid to flow through. It also requires a pump that would move the liquid around the engine and through the radiators which would cool it. This would also require quite a big design change in the engine. SLA-16 also has 135mm cylinder bores, while the 2V engines have 150mm, which means that even the cylinders are different. And SLA-16 has a much bigger bore spacing because of the poorer quality steel used since it was late war Germany, which changes the overall structure of the engine and further proves that A85 is not a copy of this engine. The only thing the engines really share is the X layout and the 16 cylinder variant has the same bank angles as the SLA-16, that being 135 and 45 degrees. But that is done because of the efficiency. Simply, 16-cylinder X-layout engines have the best efficiency at such angles. 12-cylinder variant, on the other hand, has even the different angles, 120 and 60 degrees. So, based on all of this, we can safely conclude that A85 is not a copy of the SLA-16, nor is it a modification of it. I'm not going to argue that there is no connection between them. Russians could have used the SLA-16 as an inspiration, at least. They could have seen the 16-cylinder bank angle efficiency from the SLA, but they definitely, 100% did not copy the entire engine to make their X layout engines. That is simply not true. And outside of a few translation issues which I've corrected in the video, I still believe I got it right. And Red Effect agreed with me on that. I mean, he starts the video by saying he thinks I got about 90% of it right. I didn't say that. So, just because someone makes mistakes doesn't have to mean they are always wrong. In fact, he says a lot of things that are correct in his video, but I want to try and correct some things I believe to be incorrect, based on my research. And no, the translation issue with Honda Jazz is not the only thing you got wrong. That would be it when it comes to me addressing the points brought up in the video. In his original video, Laserpick definitely made numerous mistakes, some of which are pretty obvious, but instead of trying to make a video where he corrects the mistakes and presents his arguments for the ones he believes he's right about, he chose to make a video painting me and Cone as Vatniks or T14 fanboys, which has resulted in a mass of people calling me a Russian propagandist in the comments of my videos. Whether it was his intention or not, the things he said definitely led people to believe that. T14 definitely deserves ridicule. It is a tank that has been under the state trials for at least 8 years now. It has a lot of problems with its design, a lot of which I have pointed out myself in some of my videos. Russians are stuck with not being able to launch its production and at the same time not being able to admit that they can't, so the tank is stuck in this sort of a limbo of it's coming next year, trust us. But making a video about things that are simply wrong, or that cannot be proven right or wrong, is something that must be criticized, and responding in this way to such criticism is really unprofessional, and by that I mean calling people on the other side of the argument Vatniks and refusing to cite sources. That is it, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Have a nice day.